My name is Maggie Rivas Rodriguez. I, uh, I'm a journalism professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Spanish language news media in San Antonio. Um, I ha we have a speaker who's, who's detained a little bit, but she'll be here in a minute. But I'll, I'd like to introduce to you Guillermo Nicolás. He is the president of the 3N Group, which is a privately held management development company. It specializes in urban development. The Nicolás family has been in the real estate business for over 45 years, owning and managing multifamily projects, office business parks, office buildings, and retail centers. Guillermo moved to Florida to start the Home Shopping in Español. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Home Shopping Network, but there's a Home Shopping Español uh, for the Home Shopping Network in 2000-2003 to provide shopping alternatives for Hispanics around the nation. He has lived and worked in San Antonio much, much of his life. He is a graduate of Alamo Heights High School and the University of Texas at Austin, where he had a degree that didn't really match what he ended up doing. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, good for, it was a good uh, preparation anyway. And he has pledged, pledged to start the Hispanic Media Center at UT for the betterment of Latino media students. Guillermo has focused many of his efforts on improving the art and literacy in San Antonio. He's an avid contemporary art collector has served in uh, Las Casas Foundation, the Southwest School of Art, uh, San Antonio Public Library Foundation, development of, at Art Place, the Texas Cultural Trust. He basically, if there's something having to do with art, Guillermo has a connection to it and knows <laughs> everybody who, who, has, uh, who has connections to this. Um, he has been honored by the Ford Foundation for his efforts in education and was named the Literacy Volunteer of the Year by the Texas Commission on Literacy and the Blue Star Contemporary Art Center as Contemporary Art Patron of the Year. I'm gonna ask uh, Guillermo to start up by giving us uh, an overview of, uh, of his family's connection to, to uh, Spanish language news media here in San Antonio. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I would like to start by saying that um, San Antonio was or the birthplace of Spanish language, newspaper, radio, and television in the United States, which I think is an incredibly special uh, uh, history to have as part of this tricentennial. My grandfather, Raul Cortez, was the pioneer of Spanish language radio uh, in 1946. Uh, he received his FCC license in 1943 uh, but he wasn't able to build his radio tower until 46 because of World War II. There was a steel shortage, um, and which I think is kind of an interesting point. Um, and then uh, in 1955, he opened the first UHF channel in the United States, the first full-time Spanish language television station in the United States. And there were many first, uh, which we'll get into later. And then my father, Emilio Nicholas Sr., who, uh, and of course both men, uh, Raul Cortes Sr. and Emilio Nicolás Sr., were both immigrants from Mexico who uh, came to San Antonio for their, their education and, their, and to seek their, their fortune. Uh, my father, Emilio, was, uh, came to San Antonio uh, to study uh, at St. Mary's University, and later uh, to get his graduate degree at Trinity University. And he became one of the first biologists that were one of the first groups of biologists hired at Southwest Research Foundation. And uh, because at the time, Mexican uh, Mexicans who were not residents were not admitted to medical school. He wanted to be a doctor. But to his great fortune, he became a biologist and met my mother uh, whose father was uh, already, uh, you know, had the radio business. He had by that time built the Sombrero Radio Network, which uh, was uh, spanned Texas all the way to California. And, um, and so my father uh, uh, went to work for his father-in-law while he worked at Southwest Research and worked for Jack Pitluck Advertising learning the, the television business, and he really fell in love with it. And in 1961, 
I believe 60 or 61, uh, he and a group of investors bought the station, the television station for my grandfather, and it became KWEX TV. And uh, the rest is history, and we'll get into all the, we'll fill in all the details uh, in the next hour. Um, so, yeah, well, um, I'd like to, did you want to, did you want to show your slides? Sure, we can. Let's, you want to go to the, to yeah. the next slide? So this is, so that, that first slide uh, is the title of, of the book that I might write at some point. I've had that title for about 30 years. I thought it was catchy. Um, this is a wonderful picture. I wish I could tell you who the woman is singing. Um, but this is uh, typical of, of what went on at the radio station on a daily basis. Of course, it was, radio was live in those days. So uh, not only was the singing uh, and the acting live, but so were all the commercials. So talk about uh, really being on top of scheduling people and making sure they showed up on time. The next slide, please. This is just a photo of my grandfather, Raul Cortez. Next, please. Next slide. This is just a rendering on the left. The the. Television station, unfortunately, was bulldozed a few years ago, which I think is a big loss for San Antonio. I really, I had gone to then Mayor Castro and to uh, city manager Cheryl Scully, and not really just for our benefit, but you know, because we're television and advertising people, I'm always thinking about what can we do? I live here, I, I wanna make my city better, and how can I, best promote my city. And I felt that they really should have picked up the original station building and taken it to Hemisphere, for example. Built a uh, Spanish language radio and television museum, uh, creating yet another tourist uh, destination and helping to uh, engage and educate our own population as to the great things that have occurred in our city. I think it also is something that would have helped the youth of San Antonio to help Mexican-American, uh, all children, but primarily Mexican-American children, to realize that these things were done by people just like them and that they could attain and achieve great things and that... Um, these aren't just giant corporations that kind of were birthed straight out of the womb. These were tiny little businesses and people who took great chances uh, in, in building a business that may have never existed and may never have helped to advance uh, our development. So uh, the first photo is, is a drawing of the station building. I don't remember who the architect was, but I know that it was built by, uh, by old man Zachary. So it was built by H.B. Zachary. Uh, we even have a wonderful photo on the website of H.B. Zachary, my granddad, doing the, the, the um, uh, first shovel of dirt. So it was pretty cool. It was also an important mid-century modern building. So um, it was, uh, again, the site of the first UHF channel, the first Spanish language television station. It was also the first satellite interconnected uh, television network in the world. Uh, and a year before uh, Ted Turner's famous CNN. Uh, and so everything, so when you drove by 411 East Durango, you saw a gigantic earth station, a giant white dish. That was the first private earth station in the country, right here in San Antonio. And it received the programming from the satellite from Mexico City and from San Antonio, the network was beamed out all of the programming to over 200 affiliated stations across the country. So San Antonio was uh, the center of Spanish language television for 40 plus years. Next one, please. Oh, this is a funny commercial. And if you'll notice the little black curly haired kid, the little kid with the black curly hair, that's me, at, at about age four or five. Uh, so there were no child labor laws apparently then. My dad was using me for, for cheap commercials. Next one, please. These are just two fun uh, photos 
of uh, Christmas in July type uh, advertising that was produced locally at the station. Next, please. These were, uh, this was one of my father's partners from left to right, uh, Renee Anselmo, who was out of New York. Uh, this gentleman in the center is uh, Mr. Conil, and Mr. Conil and his wife uh, opened the first Spanish language advertising company in the United States. They were Cuban, um, Cuban refugees in 1959 that went to New York and opened uh, the, the first Spanish language ad agency. And they were lovely people. I remember that he and his wife used to come to San Antonio frequently. And they, my dad loved to, the way he relaxed was going out to his ranch in Johnson City. And he had Mr. Conil plowing the front field. Uh, and I've got evidence. I've got photographic evidence. All right, next. Oh, and would, I'm sorry, would you go back? The picture on the right is uh, Emilio Azcárraga Milmo and his father, em Don Emilio Azcárraga Vidaureta. The old man, uh, as he was lovingly called by my dad, was his mentor. He was a business partner of my grandfather's. Of course, he produced all of the programming that, that we bought and uh, aired. And, and the old man also has the further distinction of being the pioneer of all of radio and television in Mexico. Uh, and, uh, and he was, according to my father, a great man and a, and a very modest man and very loving towards the Mexican people. Um, his son, perhaps not so much. <laughs> all right, next. This is the original invitation to the inauguration of the first satellite interconnected television network in the country. By the way, uh, SIN, Spanish International Network, now known as Univision, was the fourth television network in the United States. And there's a wonderful 20-year-long exhibit at the Smithsonian uh, National History Museum in Washington. And it's called American Enterprise, 1700 to the present. And in this uh, wonderful exhibit done by the Smithsonian is my grandfather, and my father, so that's, I think, a really big deal. Um, the woman on the right uh, wearing the blue skirt is Teresa Rodriguez, and Teresa was the first Spanish language, she was the first female to uh, uh, anchor a national newscast uh, in 1982 about 25 years prior to Katie Couric on CBS. So um, I told you we were a lot of first, and we're very proud of that one. Maria Elena Salinas, who's still on the air, uh, was also hired by Dad, as was um, Jorge Ramos, who I believe is coming next month for the San Antonio Book Festival. Uh, Dad brought him as a young 28-year-old from Mexico City, and employed him as the uh, news anchor at KMEX uh, in Los Angeles. Next. And that's it, just a little shameless plug for, for my website. If any of you are interested in just more history, more photographs, uh, there's a great timeline, there's some nice bios, and at the bottom of the page are all the links to the Smithsonian uh, and uh, and. Uh, other organizations, and then there's some wonderful videos on YouTube. Um, so I guess our, our other panelists may not be able to join us, but um, but I do want to say a few words about Ignacio about La Prensa. Um, the the current La Prensa that we see today doesn't have a relationship really to the original La Prensa, and that was a very very important newspaper. It was begun in uh, in 1913 here in San Antonio by uh, Ignacio y Lozano. He was from Mexico. He came here when he was 22 years old, started working at a bookstore. Now, he, one of the reasons that I think this panel is so important is because San Antonio really does serve as, as, as a, a hothouse, if you will, for Spanish language news media. It was really the crossroads. A lot of people, a lot of the people who were more uh, revolutionary and wanted to speak out against the Mexican government would come to San Antonio. This was their landing place. And from here, they created, they had bookstores. I mean, it, today you hardly see any local bookstores. Back then they had many, many bookstores. And those bookstores were owned and operated 
by people who started publishing their own newspapers as well. So when they published their own newspapers, they were small newspapers, they had limited circulation, uh, but they, and they covered a lot of what their content was, was based on Mexican politics. And it was about, you know, the, the, the government was corrupt, the government wasn't doing the right thing for the people. And it was a very, they were very elite newspapers. They were really very intellectual newspapers. So when uh, Ignacio, um, Ignacio Lozano began La Prensa in 1913, he really concentrated on the political development of Mexico. Um, and he was very critical of the Mexican government. He, within 12 years, he had the major Mexican intellectuals writing and contributing to La Prensa. It was really an important newspaper because the circulation, what he was doing was he was putting those newspapers on trains and those newspapers, La Prensa, was being distributed throughout Texas and even as far as California. The reason we know this is because there, there is some research that's been done about La Prensa and there is some research that's been done about uh, Ignacio Lozano. So people were taking their cues, Mexican, you know, Spanish speaking people were taking their cues from this, you know, relatively small newspaper in San Antonio. So that's the reason it's so important. And, and, and it was the only one of its kind. He was an incredibly ambitious person. So he started thinking, well, if I'm doing so well here in San Antonio with as much as we can circulate by train to different, different communities, I should go to California and start another newspaper because California was the other major, major uh, population center for Mexican Americans and Mexican, Mexican people. So he started La Opinión there in uh, 1926. Um, started in, in Los Angeles and because the numbers are so huge, it became, it really was established pretty well. All he had to do was drive to Los Angeles and look around and say, Oh my God, look at all these Mexican people here. <laughs> they really need a good newspaper like ours. And so he did. Um, in 1953, he died of cancer. La, La Opinión continued. Um, and 1963, La Prensa here in San Antonio ceased to, continue, ceased to operate. He, had, he was still working on La Prensa even as far as uh, being in California, but he was still coming to San Antonio and working on, on printing the newspaper here but they had very, very strong journalists. You know, Mexican Americans and Mexicans have really a very, very strong heritage of journalism. And so they've been doing this for a very long time. So it's kind of not a real surprise that then, uh, that then the Nicolás, the, the Cortez family and then the Nicolás family should become involved in the next, the next level of journalism, which was radio. Now when radio first started, uh, it, it, was, it was a very expensive thing. A lot of people didn't have radios in their houses. As it became more popular, that was when, that was really the heyday and the golden age of radio. Um, so I know that uh, one of the issues was, was just establishing here in San Antonio that radio station, they didn't start out owning it, right? Uh, the, well, the way he started out actually was before he, he actually started out owning his, I mean, he didn't start out owning his radio station. He didn't, um, you know, put it on the air till 1946 and he got his FCC license in 43. But, but as a young man, he would, um, he would buy, um, you know, an hour or, or as much as he could afford an hour or more of time on uh, on in in Nuevo Laredo, the the uh, what, what channel? K on K Mac here in San Antonio, and before that in Laredo, he would buy airtime and produce a Spanish language radio hour or two, and so as he saw that make money and really develop into something uh, that was more interesting, then then he was able to apply for for an FCC license. Yeah, so, so the, the, the way that the, the business model for radio stations was very different from what it is today, right? Right. So that, that, that model was that there would be an owner and then that owner, the, the radio station owner, would sell time on, radio st on their stations to whoever wanted to buy time. Well, they, it, it, yes, and it was mostly because they just didn't have 24 hours of, of programming because, as we said earlier, it was all live. And not until later did they start having uh, tape. And so um, just like with the television station, when my grandfather first went on the air in 55, 
Um, I believe there were only a few hours a day. It wasn't on the air for 24-7. For, for I think it was, I don't even want to say a number because I don't remember if my dad was here, he would know exactly. But I think it was maybe five or six hours at the beginning and then it, would, it, it eventually got to 12. But it was very difficult to, um, to program the station. And then when they started buying the movies from Mexico, for example, they had to be brought uh, by, by somebody. Uh, there was no FedEx or, or anything like that, and they were kinescopes, these big, thick, I think they were about this size, and they, they were heavy and cumbersome. Were and they reels? They were reels. And so, um, you know, and, and I, I know that as late as the early 70s, before it became a network that was satellite interconnected, um, I, I, I'll tell a quick story. When I went to Home Shopping Español, one of the one of the things I just took a cue from them, they were they were reviving a lot of older stars' careers, and I thought, well, why shouldn't I do that? And so one of the first former television stars that I brought uh, that that was a big deal in the '70s was Charitín, and she was from Puerto Rico, and she did a she was kind of like a Lucille Ball and Carol Burnett mix. She sang, danced, and, and did a comedy, and her shows were very popular. And so she told me uh, one day we were, we were at Home Shopping Network, and we, were having, we had a little downtime, and she told me there was a gentleman that Dad had here at the station uh, at Channel 41 named uh, Mr. Mahul. And Mr. Mahul was a Cuban-American, and he was in charge of all the programs, and literally, physically, the programs. And so when he needed more Charitín shows, he would call her up and tell her to mail them. And then he would air them all here at Channel 41, and then they would ma pack them up and mail them and send them to Los Angeles, and then Los Angeles would send them to New York, and New York would send them to Miami, and it just, and they went around uh, sharing the programming. So it was very rudimentary, but it was, uh, you know, it was better than live programming. So it kind of brings up the, the issue of you have the programming that's being brought in from Mexico. So what was the obstacles to creating local programming that, that was really directly related to the Mexican-American experience rather than the Mexican experience? I think for, from what I understood from Dad, at the time there was a shortage of, of, of uh, uh, you know, because of the Texas laws in the 50s, uh, you know, banning Spanish being spoken and a lot of other cultural uh, and political problems. There really were, was a lack of, of people that spoke uh, beautiful Spanish. And I, you know, I hate to say that, but that's the truth. I remember up until, up through the 80s, Dad had to bring his local uh, news anchors from L.A. or San Francisco uh, or other parts of the country, he had a very difficult time finding people that uh, spoke Spanish fluently, and he was also very much um, focused on, he, he was very impressed as a young man when he would watch uh, NBC, ABC, or CBS, uh, where the anchors spoke a very standard English. There wasn't a Southern English, or a California English, or a New York English, it was a very standard English. And he really felt it was very important to speak a very standard Spanish and not have the heavy accents that some of our people have. Um, today, it's, it's less important to them, but that was definitely one of the things. So it was hard to find talent. It was uh, very costly to produce uh, any programming uh, because you're talking about having to then build studios, have writers, directors, and the talent to be able to actually produce these things. They lost money for the first seven years that they had the station. And I remember my dad suffered tremendous migraines. Um, and, and it took a long time for them to make money. And there were several reasons why. First, to do kind of like my title, Spanish in the land of English. This is a predominantly English-speaking country. Uh, and uh, although there is no national language, English really is the national language. And so all of a sudden, you're this crazy Mexican, Mr. Cortez, 
wanting to do, yeah, there were a lot of people that wanted to hear the, the radio or the television in Spanish, but who in their right mind would think about uh, opening a Spanish language radio station and then television station uh, with in the middle of all of the civil rights problems, in the middle of all of the, the prejudice? In his days, one of the things my mother had years ago that we can't find any longer was a sign that said, no dogs or Mexicans allowed. So in the middle of building this radio station and later the television, uh, you had those kind of sentiments. So imagine trying to sell advertising. Uh, the majority of the businesses were, were not owned by Mexican Americans. They were mostly uh, German or Anglo owned. So the way my grandfather went around that problem was he went straight to New York. He was charming and he was uh, fun and he uh, knew, you know, kind of picture Desi Arnaz in your, in your head. He knew how to entertain people the right way. And he went to New York and he wined and dined all of the advertising people. And here he had a dinky little station in little old San Antonio, Texas, and all of its advertising was national. So he became immensely wealthy very, very quickly because he wasn't selling five and ten dollar ads, he was selling national ads. And so that was also very important. But to go back to your question about the, the ad, I mean, the Spanish language programming, Mexico was the, the epicenter of all Spanish language programming at the time. It was the golden era of the Mexican movies. Uh, it was the golden era of composers like Agustin Lara and movie stars like Maria Felix uh, and Dolores del Rio. And, and they were very glamorous. And uh, they even did a lot of movies in Hollywood. So um, th that kind of, at that point, why reinvent the wheel? I think that was also the thing. It was cheaper to buy it from Mexico than to reinvent it. Yes, it did, and I have to tell you, one of the people, <clears throat> my dad, and I'll tell you what, what happened first. First, no ratings company would rate us, and so no advertiser would buy advertising if you had no ratings, number one. Well, the first problem was UHF. They had to, my father and Renee Anselmo had to go to Washington, D.C. because they had no money, and lobby Congress themselves and demand that Congress uh, force television manufacturers, which at the time were all American, which was great, uh, to sell the television sets with the converter boxes. Because as Maggie said earlier, not only were radios, radios expensive, but then when television was invented, a television uh, cost almost as much as a car. And then to buy the separate converter, Dad said it was almost as much as the TV. Yeah, well, for people who don't know what a UHF, does so, everybody know what a UHF antenna is? Everybody knows? Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> it was either the, the bunny ears or the loop. And, and, um, and so Congress also agreed, not because my dad and Renee were such great lobbyists, but because they also were out of VHF. Uh, uh, you know, and so bandwidth or whatever it's called, wavelength. And so they had, they had to use UHF and they knew that they had to expand other, there would be other television stations in other parts of the country in English that would need UHF. And so it was to help them as well. So it was a, it was a wonderful thing. So that was the first thing. The second thing was there were no ratings. The third thing was televisions were so costly that, that you know, they, he, he couldn't tell an advertiser X number of Mexican-American households have televisions and watches. And then when dad finally, uh, uh, and I'll get to your question because it's, it's a great question. Uh, when they finally got uh, an, a, a, um, an agency to rate them, um, they went out, they came to San Antonio, they went out to all these, to the west side, the south side, where there were predominantly Mexican-Americans or Hispanics and Latinos in general. 
And a lot of them were, even though they walked in and they could hear Channel 41 blaring, they would deny that they watched Channel 41 because they were embarrassed. And it killed Dad because the ratings guys would then come back, and I believe it was Arbitron that was the first one, and they said, you, none of these people watch you, and they all told us they don't watch you. And Dad knew it wasn't true, and so he made them do it again, but he went with them. And because a lot of these guys didn't even speak Spanish, so they couldn't relate. And there were a lot of these people that didn't speak English, and so how can you communicate? So it was really very um, silly and a bit arrogant. But when he went back with them, and of course they didn't know who Dad was, they opened the door and you could see Channel 41 playing on their TV set, and they would flat out say they didn't watch it, and Dad would tell them in Spanish, of course you do, you've got it on. And eventually they broke the wall down, and they started to get um, ratings. But most importantly, and something that will totally stun you, because I even to this day uh, Univision doesn't get the share of advertising dollars that it deserves, for the for the viewership that it has, it's the they're, they're no, to this day they're number one in New York, Miami, and Los Angeles above ABC, CBS, or NBC, but they don't produce anywhere near the ad dollars that ABC, CBS, or NBC produce. Um, and so uh, even today they they face tremendous struggles and problems, but. Um, Dad would tell me he'd walk into the, the, to the breweries or to Joskies or to wherever, all these people where you knew that Mexican-Americans shopped or they drank or they ate, and they would deny that Mexicans ate or drank or purchased their items. And the first uh, person who bought advertising from Dad that he to this day is very grateful to and, and gets emotional about was uh, uh, Harry Jerzyk, old man Jerzyk uh, from Lone Star Beer. Um, his daughter is Kathleen Cooper, in case any of you know her, a wonderful lady. Uh, her father was a visionary in a way because he was an old, tough German who owned a, a wonderful brewery, but he knew Mexicans drank his beer. And he was very happy and proud to advertise on KWEX. So, yes, eventually they came and the walls fell down, but at tremendous cost and struggle. You know, Dad was even thrown out of, he told me, out of the, the boardroom at JC, I mean, at uh, Kmart in New Jersey once because they said, you know, uh, Hispanics uh, didn't buy it at Kmart. And in those days, of course, in that area, it was predominantly Puerto Ricans uh, in the New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut area. And so those were some of the struggles. But yes, eventually it did come. Well, I, I, uh, I read uh, a book that was under review by a publisher, and they talked about there was something that your, 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 uh, your family would get notices in the newspapers that people would clip to send in to prove to say this is how many people yes. are reading us yeah they had to do all kinds of stuff thanks for bringing that they you had to do they had to do all kinds of things they even uh at the beginning my grandfather used to have big stages and he'd bring they do big um concerts and they'd have uh the politicians come the politicians of the day etc and they would give away television sets so that they could actually say we have you know, 100 TV sets out there, 200 TV. So, yes, they had mail-ins. They had all kinds of stuff. One of the things and you, that, that what you said reminded me of that was interesting, up until, um, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the, the decade. It must have been the early 70s. Whenever Houston Hart bought the Express News and, and the CBS affiliate, Channel 5, up to that point, the pre previous owner would refuse to print KWEX's television schedule in the TV guide, in the TV thing in the paper. 
And uh, not until Houston Hart that bought the, the Express and absolutely, dad went in there, he tells the story better than I do, but he went in there ready for a fight. And they ended up being, you know, lifelong friends. And he used to listen to dad and dad had his whole argument just ready. And at the end of it, he used to said, we're happy to, to print it. And it was the first time in at that point in probably 25 years of having the station open that it was actually its schedule was printed in the TV guide, which is fascinating. Yeah. Um, if you, if y'all have questions, because I have a bunch of questions I can ask, but if anybody has questions, please do. Oh yes. Oh yes. Right. And she would sing the song, and then the tag would be Rediscover Downtown and Beyond the National Bank. I mean, that tag was both in English and Spanish for, you know, AWE. Sure. I read Channel 4, I remember Ed. It's a song in Spanish. Right. And did he ever... That's wonderful. I, I, I remember Ed. He was a character. That's a great story. We have a question here. So you're watching English language, an English language uh, program. Exactly. Like, I, I've seen, I've seen that too. Have you seen that? Do you I see have. That in I've, I've seen, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen it. My my husband watches a lot, watches a lot of soccer, and he'll be watching an English language soccer show on ESPN or something, and then they'll have a Spanish language. I I, I don't know. It, 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 you know, it's kind of interesting because it's just become so normal to me that I don't even I don't even. I, I think, think it's that. a little bizarre. I think that I, I think on the positive side. It, I think that the, the networks in English are feeling the heat, and I think that they know that we're the largest, the fastest growing demographic in the country, and we are the youngest. I believe we have the most, 18 to 24, which is kind of the, the sweet spot. Um, and, and I think that they're, it's kind of like my situation with Home Shopping Network. That was Barry Diller who started USA Networks and, and he built QVC and then sold it and, and bought Home Shopping Network, which he just changed to HSN. And, you know, they, uh, I'll tell you how he started, how he decided to do HSC, which I didn't know whether to be flattered. Like if, I didn't know if it was one of those stories you should tell or if they should stay in your head and you shouldn't tell. But I asked him one time, I said, why did you have the idea to do this, other than the fact that I think it's brilliant? I mean, Hispanics have great buying power. And um, he said that his, he and his wife, uh, Diane von Furstenberg, were sitting uh, having coffee on a Sunday morning, and she had read an article in the New York Times talking about Hispanic buying power. 
And uh, she told him that uh, he should do home shopping in Spanish. And that is how home shopping Espanol was born. It, it just comes to, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, for many reasons, it comes down to money. We have now, what, well over a trillion dollars in buying power? Do you know, Maggie? No, know. It's well over a trillion dollars. In 2000, when I was at home shopping, we had a whopping 400 billion. And that was, you know, unbelievable. So I think to answer your question, I don't know how they're received. I don't particularly like it, um, but I'm, you know, a bit of a old fogey about that. The reason that my grand, but I don't know why my grandfather started the television. I know why my father took it over and dedicated his life to it. And it certainly wasn't to get rich because it was the most cockamamie business you could ever be in. And, there, and, and at every turn, they could have been bankrupt and never had anything. Uh, so he did it because he truly felt a, 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 a love for the country that gave him his education. He felt a real love and passion for uh, the Hispanic people at the time when it was just San Antonio, the Mexican-American people. And he felt that it was a platform uh, with, uh, uh, with the ability to educate and entertain and to help uplift the population. And so when he ran the company, it was a lot of fun entertainment, but there was also a lot of education uh, on there. And he also used to do live editorials every Friday. And it was a way to... Um, to round people up. There was no social media at the time, and so television was it. But I think that the, uh, uh, I think the reason you're seeing Spanish language commercials on English language stations is because they want some of that money. And uh, they see that Univision is a, the last time, we, we sold the company in 1987, we bought back into it. We bought back into it and sold it three times. Uh, and the last time was 2006, and by, in, in 1987, the company sold uh, network and stations for about $600 million. In 2006, it sold for just shy of $13 billion and so to a private equity firm. And so that, that tells you that, that you know, the business is, is only going up. But if that were, to go back to your question, if that were NBC being sold, NBC, I, I don't know, would be $100 billion or, you know, more. So it's still very undervalued, very underappreciated, and very under um, advertised, even today. What do you think about it? What do you think about uh, this? Right. And um, I come from a very large family, so my younger siblings did not have the experience as I did. English was always their first language. Oh. And, um, and then the next generation is almost totally limited in Spanish. But for a lot of us, uh, flipping back and forth, it, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, it's very random. Right, mm -hmm. I agree. I think I think that you know, one of the things that Univision honors to this day, and I say to this day because they're really, 
you know, the, when these companies get so big and they're corporatized and they're owned by a big private equity firm, they start grasping at straws. It's all about, you know, the, 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 the dollars and not necessarily the viewers. But up until now, they have honored uh, having Spanish only, nothing dubbed. Um, and Dad's reasoning for that was if you, it was a respect to the viewers. If you want to watch television in English, there are three, well, really four channels with PBS. And if you wanted, and we were the alternative, we were the cultural alternative. If you wanted to watch movies and shows and all kinds of other programming in Spanish, that was your cultural alternative. And that he refused to muddy the waters and a lot of people like Lionel Sosa, really, uh, uh, who was an advertising person that Dad helped to get started, um, uh, was very pro-bilingual, and Dad fought with him uh, tooth and nail to because Lionel thought it would be cool in the early 70s to do English and Spanish language commercials all in that 30 seconds, which was a mess in Dad's mind and he refused to air those commercials on the network because that was not their purpose or their mission. Um, so it kind of brings up this other, this other issue is why people would listen and what, uh, well, why would they would, uh, they would be viewers or listeners of Spanish language news media. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've, I, I think there are a lot of people that listen to it for cultural language maintenance and there's a lot that listen to it for, for acquisition. A lot of people that don't speak Spanish really want to listen to these radio. I, I listen to Spanish language radio all the time because I want to make sure my Spanish is, is sharp. But this is a big new area. You know, Spanish language journalism in our country is a big new area. At UT Austin, where I teach journalism, uh, last semester I co-taught a class on Spanish language journalism. And oh, yeah. we're behind. San Francisco State now has a program in Spanish language journalism. San Francisco State. Uh, Miami has had one forever. Arizona State has one. More and more people are, more and more journalism departments are teaching their, their students to the, I'm not really qualified to teach Spanish language journalism because I've only worked for once, one uh, newspaper and one today for six <laughs> weeks when I was a college student um, a few years ago. <laughs> uh, but but so I, so I'm co-teaching it with people who, who who do this who have done this and, and but it's a it's a big new area so it's interesting to me to listen to the how hard it was the obstacles in place for beginning uh, for those those pioneer Spanish language radio television newspapers and then where where we are today where we're having to really um, think about how do we best prepare people so that they are able to have bilingual reporters covering the news, not just people that they're bringing in from another country, but people who are from here who can understand this, the American governmental system. So right. it's really interesting. It is very interesting. I, I, uh, I want to give you a plug because I, I want you to know uh, Maggie and I met when I was first invited to the board of the College of Communications at UT. And Maggie runs a, not aside from just being from, well, not just, but from being a professor at UT, she also runs the uh, Voces Latino and Latina World War II uh, history program. And they have gone out and interviewed uh, hundreds uh, of World War II vets that were uh, Latino and, and Latinas that were never even acknowledged um, and now has these wonderful oral histories of these people who fought for the for our country so I think that's a, a wonderful thing and now you're expanding to Viet to Korea and Vietnam I believe and, and political and civic engagement so we've actually interviewed um, uh, Guillermo's uh, dad uh, and his mom who's sitting right here Eva Nicolas um, and they, they both have had amazing interviews and it's all about the beginning years of the of the television station, it's 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 really a remarkable gift. So thank you, thank you. For yes, of course. Well, I we have so. a question back here.
Right. Right. Yeah. No, that's why that's why Henry Gedla was so successful. His English was first he had a great vo I mean he had a million dollar voice. Uh may he rest in peace, but he also didn't have a, an accent. And and see the same thing would have applied with us. You couldn't work in Spanish language radio or television if you had a heavy accent in 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 either another from another country, say Puerto Rico, I mean another um, country like Cuba or whatever, or from a, you know kind of a very English accent with your Spanish. So you're right. I, I think it's very difficult. I think a lot the odds were always against them. Yeah, I, and I think the the point about the language is really important because a lot of times people from Mexico think that you know we Mexican Americans don't want to speak Spanish. And the truth of the matter is that we were prevented from speaking Spanish when we were growing up. That's so right. It's a generational issue. <laughs> Good night and muy buenas noches. That's right. I remember that That's very, right. very well. We have a question back here, and we only have a few more minutes. No, you're 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 very correct. The Italians mm -hmm. suffered that, not necessarily in San, I mean, I'm sure there were Italians in San Antonio, but in New York, the Italians were very uh, 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 you know much pushed to not speak Italian. The French, it really was every immigrant immigrant group. You are you're absolutely correct. I think we have time for one more question. Back here. I don't think there was, you know, I don't know because La Prensa ceased uh, print in what, 53? 53. In 53. No, no, and 63. I'm 63, sorry. I'm sorry. So perhaps up to 63, there was a lot of collaboration between uh, the, the Lozanos and, and my grandfather and, uh, and, and perhaps my dad. Um, then they ceased to to exist until 1989. And by that time, we'd already sold the company and were, were out of the day-to-day -day business. Um, I believe they, was it 89 that La Prensa came back? I, I don't know. Yes, I believe it was not, when, when the um, Durans, you know, re, reinstated it, I believe it was 1989. Well, they reinstated the name. Just the name, just the name. Just the name. So it's, it's a, a totally different, different paper, yeah. Um, and but I know that there was always a lot of collaboration between the TV stations. In the old days, TV stations were owned by local people. So, you know, the House started Channel 4, uh, the Roths owned Channel 12, the, um, uh, the Hearts owned Channel 5, and we had Channel 41, and they all really did like each other. I remember all those people at our house as a young man, they were there was a lot of camaraderie. There was a lot of love. To this day, Dad and Houston Hart, I think they're the last two. Ed, Ed's gone. Mr. Half is gone. 
and certainly Bob Roth and, and uh, is gone, but Dad and Houston are the last two survivors, and they still see each other and have lunch together when they can. So I think there was a lot of, uh, there was never, you know, one of the things that I love, Channel 41 had the only two-story studio at the time. So Channel 5 would come and film some of their commercials at Channel 41, but in English, for their airing. And Channel uh, 4 and, and 12 did too, and so there was a lot of uh, reciprocity and a lot of camaraderie. Today, probably not so much, because they're all just owned, they're just giant corporations owned by people, you know, out in the stratosphere somewhere. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.